Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the JPN podcast. Um, for those of you joining that may not have seen our other videos, uh, this particular series is dealing with the Chaburas that were curated by Rabbi Sprung at the Basin Medjish School of Medical Halacha. This is uh, episode number one on suicide, for which we hope to have a larger CME accredited event soon to come. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Rabbi Baruch Fogel, who is a lecturer at NYSCAS and uh, um, rabbi at Turo Long Island Law School and often gives shirim at both New York Medical College and Turo.com. And today he's going to be discussing the first booklet we posted by Rabbi Sprung on the topic of suicide. Hi, everyone. So yeah, we're going to go through the sources um, that the booklet put out on saving someone who is attempting suicide. Um, here we go. So source number one is the, the one of the primary sources, the Pasuk in the Torah, which basically says, Lo samen al dam re'echa, cannot stand by the blood of your neighbor, and Hashem, I am Hashem, which we understand to be that you can't do, and you have to do something, and you can't let um, someone that you see dying um, go ahead and die. So the Gemara, uh, expands on this. And this is really, this Gemara, understanding this Gemara and how to, uh, the, the back and forth and the question and answer is really what the whole, this whole lecture that, uh, and the booklet that we are about to um, understand is really uh, focused on really getting to the bottom line of understanding the beginning and the answer of this Gemara. So the Gemara starts off. How do you know that if you see your friend drowning in a river, or if a being dragged away by a wild animal, or listened by in the love, or there are he's being attacked by bandits. So how do we know that a, a person who sees someone else whose life is threatened? Where is the Torah verse that tells us that he they ha, you have to go ahead and do something to save your friend? The Gemara answers Talmud You cannot stand idly by by the blood of your friend. If the Gemara would stop here everything would be pretty, you know, straightforward. It sounds like exactly what the Torah wanted. Don't stand idly by, give you a few examples. Everything great. Of course, we would always ask a question, to what extent? To um, how far do we have to put ourselves out? Do we have to sacrifice our own lives? That the Gemara doesn't address. And it's really not addressed um, in the Gemara. It's addressed later on. But the, the, the fact that we actually have an obligation to go and do something, that is what the Gemara addresses. But now the Gemara asks a very interesting question. Is really that the source? We have another completely different source, a Brisa, based on a totally different Pasuk. What's the Pasuk? Avedas Gufo Minayin. So the, the, the background, there's, there's a mitzvah in the Torah called Hashavas Aved. There's a mitzvah in the Torah to return a lost item, object to, a, uh, to the person who owns it. So if you find a pair of keys on the floor, if you find a wallet on the floor, whatever you may find, Obviously, the Gemara's case is, you know, you know, coins or food or whatever it may be. You have a mitzvah in the Torah called the Shabbos Aved, returning a lost object. It means if a person drops something <clears throat> or loses something, and you know who it is, you have, or even if you don't know who it is, you have to go and expand some effort into re re restoring and returning uh, the person's object to themselves. You can't assume just because they're no longer connected to it, it is no longer theirs. It is still theirs, even though they have lost it, even though they're not in control of it. Nevertheless, you have a mitzvah to return. So the Gemara asks, we have a b'risa that says, how do you know that you have to return the loss of a body? <clears throat> now, what does that mean? It mean a lost body, right? You can't lose your arm, you can't lose your body. What is the Gemara referring to? So the Gemara, obviously, the, the, the b'risa, the Gemara understood that to mean we're understanding it as when there is a chance of a person's body being lost from them. How? meaning the same exact cases, you see a lion chasing someone. So it's not the same exactly as a lost object. So I'm here, my wallet is down the block. So you have a mitzvah to return those two things together. Here, there is a danger, there's a situation where my soul and my body will be separated, i.e. death. So you have to return the body to the soul so that they, they should be complete, which is, i.e. saving someone's life. How do we know that? Talmud Lomar Vahashivot Solo. 
So the way the, the drush of the Pasuk, which is to, even though the Pasuk is definitely referring to return it to him, means we're turning yourself to yourself. So we're turning your soul to your body, however, your life to yourself. So we see from that Gemara that there is a, that why, that there's another clear source that you have to make sure that someone doesn't die. But the way if you use that Pasuk, it's telling you that return the body to itself. And that is also teaching us that when you see someone in danger, of having their body and soul separated, you have to go ahead and return the return that return it, which is not returning, make sure that it doesn't happen. So now the Gemara is a problem. Why do we need both sources? And we started off that the source was Lo Samen Al Dam And now the Gemara said, but wait a second, I have another source of Ashivo Solo. So normally we don't normally have two sources for the same exact idea. So the Gemara says, Ime Hasam, if it would only be from the source of Ashivo Solo, have I mean I might have thought Hanimili Benafshe. You have to extend effort. You have to, you know, put yourself out. You gotta walk, you gotta give some time, some effort. You can't just sit and you can't do nothing. You have to you have to do something. Have a mitrach or megar agure, but to go ahead and really put an effort or spend your own money to hire workers. Aim I would have thought not. That means if you see someone's uh, wallet on the street and the only way to get it is um, very, very difficult. Or as the Gemara tells us, and this will be relevant later on, if you, if it's maybe it's not your, in your cover, it's not your honor, or if you're a Kohen and it's in a base like Kvaros, whatever it may be, there are certain instances where the Torah doesn't demand that you drop everything and spend all your money just to return the guy's wallet. So if, it would, if we would only know to return someone's life, to save someone's life from the source of the Hashem Salo, we might not know all situations, meaning a situation where you have to really expend effort or really spend money. Kamashlam, therefore, that is the necessity to have the Pasuk of Losam and Odam Reyecha. The Pasuk tells you you can't stand idly by, which seemingly this Gemara concludes. It tells us that that Pasuk of, of Losam and Odam Reyecha obligates a person <clears throat> more than Mahashivos Salodas. Mahashivos Salod obligates minimally, and Losam and Odam Reyecha implies you really can't stand idly by. And if it's going to cost you money, you got to do it. And if it's really going to be a, a very, very difficult, you got to do it. Where the Gemara understood that from in Los Amon Adam Recha, maybe we'll see later, but that is what this Gemara comes out. So this Gemara, in a nutshell, brings out there are two possible approaches to restoring someone's life, saving someone's life, and each one of the, and one of those sources obligates less or more than the other. That's source number one, and I think what everything is built on. So um, I have I just like to ask a little bit of my questions. You know, I know that's the Gemara. Um, and, and this is what we call a hakira or a question we could ask them in some way. Um, what is the reason why returning a person is a limited obligation? Why would it not require an expenditure of money? There are two possible reasons. And that's always, whenever you learn a Gemara you, you, and, you, and you're bothered by this question, because the Gemara, you know, the Gemara doesn't explain, but it makes a statement. So um, is, it because tech, is it because technically similar to returning a lost object or it's a lesser form of obligation? Um, and then, how are lost objects and almost dying similar? And I sort of, you know, you know, preempted this question before. Now, something that I would like to think about, and because today's class is about suicide, we understand that um, when an object is lost, at that moment, my wallet's there and I'm here. The Gemara says when an animal is or a bandit is after you, it is similar to your, your, your being lost. So what's, how is that possible? That means... We're in a situation where the body and soul are about to be separated. Um, <clears throat> so, and again, as I, I tried to have the Rashi here, and Rashi says, Hoshev es gufo la'atzmo, return the body to himself. So that is the basis of the obligation. So my question, and my, my thought question to, you know, to myself when I learned the Gemara is, what is the exact scenario that we're dealing with? Are we dealing with someone who is planning on committing suicide? Are we, uh, you know, when we're applying this Gemara to suicide, are we a person who's already started committing suicide? Is it relevant to someone who gives directives that what will happen in a situation when I will be dragged by a lion or any other medical situations? Is it, um, it does it have to be an actual situation where the body and soul are separated and, or almost separated and you have to return it to yourself? And I think the reason that's relevant is because if, again, 
and we'll see in a second why we're focusing on Vahashavosalo to return the body to the soul. We have to ask, well, is it only a situation where the soul is removed from the body or being removed from the body? Is it when we know it will happen? And again, and and question number two, or when we because we're saying that it's a lesser form of obligation, why is it? Is it because like listen, it follows the rules of my of returning the lost object, even though it doesn't make sense because one's a body and one's a, one's a soul. But since it's the same verse, we have no choice but to limit it to what that's referring to. Or for some reason, it's a lesser form of obligation. It's telling you, listen, when you can um, do something, it's a nice thing to make sure that these don't get separated. But it's not like you are, you know, you have to make sure that the results don't occur. So I think those are the two questions that we have to think about when applying this Gemara, meaning what was the what does the Hashi Vosalot teach us? And how would we apply it to scenarios where a person is not yet separated from his body, but will happen? Does the verse apply? So those are the two things that I would just like to, I pondered when I, when I read these sources. Yeah, I, I think that, that's a really interesting point. Um, and what I found really interesting is that the Gemara brings those two sources, and it seems like we're learning a lot more from the other source. We're learning a lot more from Los Amog. And, and there's, there's so much discussion here about Bashi Vosalo, where the Gemara doesn't ponder why we even have two necessarily, right? We, what, once we answered why we have the first, we could have con, kind of just said, okay, but, but let's just go with that. But there's so much to learn from Bashi Vosalo. And you, I, I'll be very honest. If you would learn that Gemara straight up, like you just said, that is exactly how I would learn it. That the Gemara bottom line is is the end all and be all. It obligates me the most. And that's what I need. And everything else I can forget about. And if it wasn't for the, the uh, you know, source sheet today, I might have even said that. There are two problems with that. Problem number one is um, the next source we will do uh, focuses on Vashavosolo, and we'll see why in a second. And also because the Rambam seems to make Vashavosolo the main source in a way. Right. So because of that, we are spending time on something that at a, at a cursor reading of Gemara would say, forget about it. The Gemara says, that obligates you more. So yeah, the Gemara might have had a hava mean of Hashem and there's a price so that says it, but at the end of the day, who cares? But because of Minchas Chinuch, because of the Rambam, that's why we're spending so much time focusing on what this teaches us. Which obviously brings us to the next source. Um, so to, to just to set up the next source, which is the Minchas Chinuch, we need a little bit of background information. And that is um, in regards to lost objects. So we said there's a big mitzvah in the Torah called Hashavah Saveh, they're returning a lost object. Um, however, says the Shulchan Aruch and Kosh Mishpat, Hamadim Mimono Ladas, if a person makes his money lost on purpose, Ladas meaning according to his knowledge, in his kakalo, you don't have to help him. Kate said, for example, what's the example? You put your animal in a barn without a door, below kosher, and you don't tie it up, and you leave. Now, the, some say that's not true. That's, that's, if it's in a barn, it might be different. But let's go to the next case, which is obvious. You throw your wallet into Rosh Hashanah. This guy got rid of his own money according to his own opinion. Now, don't tell me it's Hefker. That's what the point of the Shulchan Aruch. You might have said, if I throw my wallet away, I gave it away. Even though you cannot take it, you can't take it because it's still his. He didn't make it hefker, didn't make it ownerless, he didn't give it away. He just separated it from himself in a way that it would be considered lost. But since, so on one hand, it's still his, but on the other hand, it's lost from him. But he made it lost. Says the Shochanarch, you do not have to return it. Shnemer Asher Tovad, Tovad is lost. Uh, excluding when a person makes it lost by himself. Now, the tour does bring, by the way, that, no, that's not true here, that, in, if you, that every Aved de Midas is Hefker, and sort of this whole thing won't be relevant, that every time you separate it, what you're really doing is, you're actually giving it up and saying it's not yours anymore. But let's go, going with the Shulchan Aruch, willful losing, and I, I wrote it up, just a brief summary, may not be Hefker ownerless, if you go to Shulchan Aruch, and there's no Mitzvah to return. So that means when it comes to lost money, we have this very weird situation where the person and his money, which he still owns, is separated, and you have no mitzvah to 
In other words, to make it whole, to make sure that this situation gets rectified, that the money goes back to its owner. Again, if it's ownerless, then you can keep it. That's not a question, it's obvious. And if, it's, and if he didn't do it on purpose, you have the midst of the Torah. But if he caused it, that his money is lost from him, then there's a, the Torah has an ex, uh, exclusion and you are not re- required, there's no mitzvah whatsoever to return that lost object to him. So why is this relevant? Because again, so now we have the Minchas Chinuch. So the Minchas Chinuch says, I have, a, I have an interesting uh, thought, thought question. Nira Lachor, it seems possible. Im echad ma'avid a person is committing suicide. V'yochal echad l'hatzilo, and someone can't save them. Efshar de'ina muzar al-alav. Perhaps he is not commanded to. Lo'i mi boi, meaning, lav meaning of a lo'sam al-adam recha, that's, which is, the, which is interesting. Because of course, the hashev vosolo doesn't apply. Why? Because we, and that's where we just saw the previous source. We just saw that there is no mitzvah to return a lost object when you caused it to be lost from yourself. So the Minchah Sinuch makes a very logical assumption that if you cause your body to be lost from your soul, there's also no mitzvah to return it. The same way, if you cause your wallet to be lost from you, there's no mitzvah to return it. But you then might ask the obvious question, okay, so then no have Ashivos alone. Big deal. You still got Lo Samad al Damriacha, right? Which was your question before. Ella Af al Halav, Azaini Muzo. Even this lav, meaning a Lo Samad, you won't be commanded. Why? Because the Gemara says, we just did the Gemara said, what is the difference between the two? And the Gemara only gave out um, um, what, what was the Gemara scenario to spend money. Well, he says, well, if I have a very much easier scenario, Aveda Midas. If it's true, like we just said, that Hashivot Salo doesn't apply by Veda Midas or by, uh, by, by a person who is Ma'abed Asbel Das. But um, Losam al Damrecha would apply, then I don't understand. So then the Gemar should have given that as an answer. So by, you know, proof of, by lack of proof or proof of lack, by the fact that the Gemar didn't include that as the difference between the two, we can infer that the law wouldn't also apply. So uh, the Minchas Chinuch says, obviously, Vashivos Olo doesn't apply by suicide, because just like returning money. And the Losam Odam Recha, by inference from the Gemara, not using that, which seemingly a very obvious difference between the two, that obviously teaches us that Losam do- doesn't apply as well. That's what the Minchas Chinuch says. The, that, that's the source. Now, this is really the jumping point for Rabbi Sprung's um, booklet, is w- w- this Minchas Chinuch, this approach, which he seems to you know, say... Um, and without hesitation, and he, you know, his inference is, you know, pretty good inference that um, so by suicide there would be neither someone committing suicide there would be neither Vashivosolo or Losam al Damrech. The problem with the Minchas Chinuch is we get to the other problems. We just, as I said, said, okay, let's say you have a great understanding of the Gemara. What's the logic? In, in other words, yes, the Gemara should have included it, and that's a great question. So we can either try to answer that question, but before we even answer that question, we have to ask ourselves, why not? Losam al Dam Recha says, do not stand by on your on the flat, you know, don't stand idly by uh, your friend's blood. So what would the logic be telling me that if he's trying to kill himself, I wouldn't have that problem? So the the answer seemingly, even though Minchas Sinuch doesn't say this, the answer lying behind the Minchas Sinuch seems to be that just like if I push my wallet in the street, even though it might not be Hefker, but if I push it away from me, it's I, I, I'm saying is I don't want I don't you don't you don't have to worry about it if I don't worry about it. I don't care about it, you don't care about it. So Losan al Damrech says don't stand on your friend's blood. So it's the same thing. If my I don't care about you know you don't have to be firmer than me. You don't have to care about me more than I care about myself. So even though he doesn't say this, it has to be, or seemingly has to be the inference. Of what he's, um, what of, of the logic of that he's trying to get at. So, if I could just make sure that I understand it and that everyone who's watching, it, it, you know, can clearly get it. Um, <clears throat> the Minchas Chana is, is bringing down this obvious, what well, seemingly obvious statement to him that the 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 pasuk of Lasamad is not going to apply 
in a case of someone who is taking their own life, who's putting their life in danger. Um, and he says that because he's, he's inferring from the fact that the Gemara has a very straightforward logic. The Gemara has two sources of the fact that you have to save your friend. And we ask, what's the difference? And based on what we were saying right before this, the obvious difference would have been someone putting themselves in danger. Because if we're talking just in terms of Hashem Saveda, then you wouldn't have to save that person. The same way as when they throw their wallet away, similar to when they like, throw their life away. The, 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 the Pasuk of Hashem Saveda wouldn't apply. So then the Gemara could have said, so that's why I need both Pesachim. But the Gemara didn't say that. The Gemara said the difference was in terms of hiring workers or, or you know, spending excessive amounts of money to protect a person. So he's saying from the fact that Gemara didn't answer the obvious, um, the person throwing their life away, the, the suicide case, then you see that in the case of suicide, there actually wouldn't be a difference. Both psukim would not apply. And therefore, there'd actually be no pasuk compelling you to save that person. Is that? Okay, so he's, he's, so he's deriving it from Gemara. Hi, again, I just make, I just want to make clear that the Yudha Siddur doesn't explain. He just says from the Gemara, it seems like your, your recap explained. He says it's clear from the fact that Gemara didn't include it, it's excluded. But he doesn't right. explain the logic. That's what we're just trying to explain the logic. Right, right. So the next step is the logic of why that would be. And, right. so and that would be, it's our conjecture what that logic, where the logic came from. Right, okay. Okay. Um, and now I, I want to bring to a very, again, so a few questions. How do you willfully lose a body? And which is really what I, again, I was, I was you know, uh, what do they call, what they call it, the pre-gaming before. So what does it mean when, you, when you're in a question of suicide? Um, is it have to be in the midst of suicide? That's when you're separated the body and the soul. And again, what is relevant to, uh, obviously, you know, there's two, you know, two uh, clinicians and physicians, would be a question of not only if a person is in the act of suicide, but if the person gives an order to let him die which is not suicide in the, in the, in the uh, aspect that he is taking his life, but rather he's saying, I don't care or want you to intervene when there will be something in the way of taking my life. So that would be a whole different question. Maybe we could even say that it's not the same as suicide. So that's a question I think we have to think about. If the Hashem is the, is the is the jumping off point, like the Pesach says, we have to think, is suicide or the modern day case of suicide, like a DNR, DNI, would that be included? That's question number one. But now I want to get to the logic. And here's a really crazy thing. If you think about it, we have a, we have a halach called Rodef. Well, Rodef says, that again, Paulo Samadam Recha, we also learned it from, from Naira Hamurasa, that if A is trying to kill B, we, the bystanders, are allowed to and commanded to kill A to save B. Even though you, could, you might have said, hey, someone's dying, either A or B, who well, might I didn't intervene. The Torah tells us the laws of Rodef that if you see A, the pursuer, the guilty party on the way to kill B, you may go ahead, pardon me, um, and kill A to save B. Well, I have a better question. If A is trying to kill A, do we kill A to save A? Now that sounds silly. It means if A is trying to kill himself and he's not being successful, should we kill A so he stops him from killing A? You know, like, well, that's very funny. <clears throat> but here's a really good point. If A hires B to kill himself, so A or hires, so, you know, he wants to commit suicide, but he's afraid to do it. So he has his friend to push him. Can you kill B to stop him from killing A who hired B to kill him? Now, that's seemingly... Confusing. Uh, <laughs> it's confusing, but it's seemingly a very... In other words, how far do you take this point? <clears throat> how far do you take this point that A's life, when he wants to kill himself, you have no B'Hashevo Solo, and you have no Losam Adam Recha like the Minchas Sinach, would you even say that there's no Din Rodef? Now, the Mincha Sinach in earlier sources, in the earlier part of the Mincha Sinach, does seem to indicate that you would have a mitzvah of Rodev. So it's, it's not clear from the Mincha Sinach himself how he understands when A hires B to kill him, where the, why there's no Rodev. B is trying to kill A. You got to stop him. But A hired him. So um, this is part of all the question of how, how do you understand this logic, which again, we are inferring from the word of the Mincha Sinach, that when A is in the process of killing himself, that's the case in the Sinuch, there's no low samod. I mean, he's, there's no murder going on. It's hard to understand, but that's seen what the Milch Sinuch wants to teach us in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so here you have, and now, now, now that we've, we've, we've set up the Milch Sinuch, um, we, we have to just make the obvious point. And there's a big, that, that suicide is forbidden. So we have the Rambam, 
um, in Hilchos Mitzvah Hashmir Sadefesh. The Rambam says if you hire someone to kill your friend, oh, let's see, here we go. Um, or you all right if you if you send servants to kill him, you tie him up in front of a lion, and if you try to commit suicide, all those people are murderers. They're guilty of shedding blood, and and you're you're you're, you're I mean, you deserve to die by the act of God. Obviously, Bezin doesn't. Uh, it's not punishable by Bezin because for Bezin to actually carry a capital punishment, there are very very strict. Uh, regulations and why that is is beyond their view of today. But the Rambam definitely includes murdering someone else to, and it says the same thing as close to murdering yourself. And how does he know this? Bring the Pazuk, and we don't have all the sources, um, but based on the Book of Mormon, Baba Kama, that says, Shofech Dom Adam Adam Dom Yishofech, says, you know, spilling the blood of a man um, by a man, his blood should be spilled. Right, it, it, and it says that means it refers as as mecha as dimchul nafshech medrosh in zeh horigatmo. So the Rambam includes it says very very clearly that killing yourself is an avera of murder. There's no difference if you're killing someone else or killing yourself. So the the problem with this is obviously the nimchul sinuf will have to deal with these sources. That <clears throat> first of all, what about the avera of killing yourself? But more than more, more than that, if if it's an avera to kill yourself, so. Then where does Los Samar al Damriacha go away? In other words, if Los Samar al Damriacha tells us, don't let death happen, and here death is murder is happening, it happens to be by yourself. You still, you even yourself are not allowed to do it. So even if yourself are not allowed to do it, <clears throat> and meaning you're not, your life is not yours to give away. That's the implication of the fact that your guilt, you, you, the Torah forbids you from committing suicide. If your life is not yours to give away. Then how could maybe for a Hashavos alone for some technical reason maybe wouldn't apply when you separate your body from your soul? But Osam al Damrech, which is don't let murder happen in theory, even if you give it away, you weren't allowed to give it away. So if you're not allowed to give it away, then <clears throat> the Aver would apply of kill yourself, and Osam al Damrech would still apply. So this is the, the you know the the underlying question that the Minchas um, uh, brings up is a what is the logic of Osam al Damrech? But how do you get around the fact that killing yourself is an avera, meaning you're not in control. You don't have the right to kill yourself. So we can never really say aveda midas. <clears throat> I'm allowed to put my wallet in the street. Now, Yaakov Avinu would never put his wallet in the street. He went back for Pachim Kanim. But if you want to give away all your money, no problem. A fool and his money soon parted. But <clears throat> everyone agrees you can't give away your soul. You're not going to put your soul away from you. Even if you tried it, if you want to do it. So how can the Minchas Chinuch uh, say that, you know, it's like you put it away, we, there's, no, there's no problem, and we don't have to bother with you because you did it already. It's not yours to do. So you might have done the action of trying to kill yourself. But from our vantage point, when you try to kill yourself, it is, that it is as if someone else is trying to kill you. And just like I would stop B from killing you, I have to stop you from killing you. Which goes back to our question before, even to kill the person. <laughs> well, leaving that aside. So this is really, you know, once you the the I guess the, the, if you want to set it up as the two opposite poles, the Mincha Sinach seems to see, say that your life is in your hands, and the, clearly from the Rambam, the Gemara, that your life is not in your hands. And then we would ask the question, well, would Lo Salman al Damriyecha apply when you want to kill yourself, but you don't have the right and the life is not in your hands? So if I could just uh, <clears throat> summarize and, and add one or two things. So first, um, I want to, you know, we, we try to, put out disclaimers for, for sensitive topics. And I wanna highlight that this is a very like academic focused topic. And that obviously when we talk about suicide as a serious issue in any community, um, we, we don't negate the, the emotional components and the psychological components. This is strictly just meant to understand the academic side of things um, and like the moral side of things from a Jewish perspective in terms of owning one's life and the autonomy one has to take their own life. So I do want to like put that out there because it seems like what we're saying may be a little bit harsh in that sense, but it's important to understand the context of this conversation as like an academic conversation. Um, if I can interject, I know you're in the middle, but I want, yes, I want yes. to point which the, which the pamphlet of the book makes very well, that, um, you know, mental health uh, issues um, are very, very much at the forefront of our thoughts always, especially these days when people are really suffering and um, we're, we're becoming more and more aware of, you know, people's mental health sufferings and everything we're talking about here and suicide and all that has nothing to do with mental health. It shouldn't be 
um, you know, we're commanded at every step of the way to, you know, make sure that people are healthy and that anyone struggling with mental health issues deals with them. Um, we are dealing with, as you said, an academic concept of suicide, you know, a purely Gemara way of thinking of someone who, for whatever reason, not mental health, just wants to think about this topic, but it is, you know, one should not construe it or take this topic in any way to deal with people today who are struggling with, with these topics. Yeah, and I, I was just gonna, yeah, just off of that, I think um, it's important to realize that when we talk about it from like an actual very practical perspective, the, the two conversations are they're always interrelated and we focus on the mental health and it's, it's not, you know, this is not representative of that conversation that we have in practice. Um, and then, okay, so that said, I wanted to just summarize to make sure that I understand everything. So it seems like we're really, like we had two components of the Minchas What, like we, like because we have two Pesukim, we have right, the Losanwad and we have the, the, the Hashivosa. Mm -hmm. And so the one problem is the Hashivosa is that there seems to be this assumption that in the same way that you have ownership of your wallet and when you throw it away, um, there's no, there's no obligation for someone to help you that the same thing with a life, if you were to like, you know, hypothetically throw out your life. And the question that we're, we're bringing based on these sources is that you, they're not really comparable because you don't have the ownership of your life in the same way that you have ownership of a wallet. The Minchas Tanakh seems to be, um, assuming that you have that ownership, but we're seeing in the sources that that's not necessarily the case. And it seems like in the other, the other side of things is that we briefly mentioned a possible logic that if a person doesn't care about their life in the sense that like you don't have to be firmer than them, you don't have to care about their life more than they do. But again, that logic doesn't seem to hold up. If we're saying that this is an Avera, this is something that you shouldn't do, then, then that logic doesn't seem to hold up to just say that that, that obligation just disappears. So from both components, we have to understand where is the Minchas Khan coming from? That would be the, the problems that we have to deal with. And in, in, the, in the source sheet, they have this wonderful Sefer Hasidim. I mentioned it briefly in a footnote, but, um, you know, just to, to emphasize the Rambam's point, um, and it brings it just an interesting case. Someone's trying to steal your money, and you can run away. You can run away. Um, and he's, but a person says, you know, like the famous, you know, give me your, your money or your life, your wallet or your life. So here it's the Sefer Hasidim. He says, give it, but in reverse, give it to locally also mom and lomali chayim. But to take away all my money, whatever he has, let's say he has all his money in his wallet. Why bother living? So he's going to fight back. Or go el adam. Allah is that, you know, if someone, times of chazal, not now, but um, you, a go el adam, the times of the Torah, the, the family member of the person killed can go ahead and take revenge. Again, depending when, if it's a shogeg, not. They can go to Ir Miklot, but if it's not a show gig, they can, they can take revenge and try to have a revenge killing. So he's, the Seven Sims says, what if you have a Goel Adam? But what if the murderer is this Borozov? For those of you who remember, remember the Golden Crown, right? This seven-foot giant coming out of the forest. He's gonna, he's gonna, you can't kill him either, right? Or, you know, let's say there are organized crime people who, who have more guns than you will ever have. So are you, you're allowed to, technically from the Torah, you're allowed to, maybe even a mitzvah, to avenge the killing. Again, not in today's times, we're talking about in the time of the Torah. Um, so he said, you know what? I'm going to go take revenge, even if it costs my life. So the Minchas, the, sorry, the Sefer says, no, no, or he says, or, or if you have a house that's falling down in a fire, and you go in to save your money. All of those people who risk their lives and again, you could make a logical case for each one. No, you're committing suicide instead of Aveira. You're not allowed to do it. See, so the reason I bring this, they brought it in, the reason to make the point clear, you have a good reason. Could even be you have a mitzvah to go do it. Because depending how you learn the concept of Goyal Adam, uh, that the, the family member who avenges his wealth, his blood, could be even a mitzvah. Could be it's a Roshos, could be it's a mitzvah. So, and even so, if you do it in a situation where it's going to cause your own death, suicide. It's also, you're not allowed to do it. So we see here that even to do a mitzvah, definitely for a good idea, you're not allowed to commit suicide. So that just shows you how far your life is not in your hand. If you cannot sacrifice your life, even for a good idea, even for a mitzvah. So that just brings home the Rambam, how, you know, or the opposite of the Menchah Sinach approach. Right, right. I, I think um, it's, nice, it's nice to highlight that 
when we talk about this and we, we, we say how it's so not in your hands, that, that it's essentially is the equivalent of saying how valuable we see life is as an extension of God. And I think that's like an important thing to highlight because I think people will see this and sort of say, it's not in my hands. And, um, it's just important to, to, to highlight that, like, when we, we look at a body, because we're going to have further conversations about physician assisted suicide and things of that nature. And it's not so much a lack of autonomy, but rather that such high elevation that a body is an extension of God and God's hand. That's why we respect it so much. And that's, what, you know, where this conversation comes into play. Right. And, and the, 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 just to add on to that, um, the underlying, what you just said is the underlying idea, which is the respect of life and, you know, how we view it. Um, so let's go on then. Now, what's very interesting is we, we made an assumption before. Now we have to sort of question if our assumption is correct. And that is, the Torah said, Lo samar al dam reyecha. The Torah said, do not stand idly by when uh, on your friend's blood. Why? Like every other bit in the Torah, we can ask the question, why? Now, sometimes like, come on, that's an obvious one. But, you know, yeah, why shake a little? I get. Why put on tefillin? Maybe I get. But, oh, come on. But the Sefer HaChinuch, not the Milch the Sefer HaChinuch, which is going on, um, did the unbelievable task of going through all 613 mitzvahs and explaining it. And it's very valuable to take a look at how he explains Lo Sa'am Adam Re'acha, because the insight might actually be very helpful to us. So this is from the same, the Sefer HaChinuch, Shorash Mitzvah Zu Yudua, the root, meaning that's how he defines, um, that's the word he uses for all mitzvahs, the Shorash, the root of this mitzvah, why you command it. Ki Kemoshi Yatzil HaEchad Haschavero, Kein Chavero Yatzil Oso. Just like, so you'll save your friend, and he'll save you. And the world will be populated and inhabited. And God, and God really desires habitation of the world. He wants the world to be filled with people. Right? It's one of the something to think about is when God created the world, he created a world, a very, very full world. Tons of animals, every species, and trees galore, and mountains, and fish, everything you want. And two people, a male and a female. And they were, and their job was to fill the world. So, in a way, if you always wonder what man's job, and, you know, human beings' uh, position in this world is, God said, "I created a beautiful world. I could have created millions of people. I created two people to tell you that I want you to finish my job of creating and fill the world. So every time you create another life, you are, in a way, continuing the act of creation. The original, because again, there were thousands of trees that first day." And two people, male and female. So every act of creation and saving life is actually, it's not just a regular, okay, it's nice, it's what God said, procreate, it's good, have children, we all have to have children. No, God says, I'm letting you be my partner in, in finishing the population of the world. For the world is meant to be inhabited and populated. Now, that's a very nice rabbinic sermon. Yay. But there's something very, something very, I, I, I would say even bothersome. If I would have asked you two minutes ago, before we read the source, why did God say, Lo Sam al Dam What would you have said? You might have said, Certainly not this. What? Certainly not this. You would not have said this, right? This, this is a way a lot, um, a lot, you know, this is like a, like a you know, like a, out of left field or a curveball, is a basal reference. I would have said, well, we don't want people to die because, you know, we don't, and, and if you can do something about it, it's like you, you, like you had a hand in killing them or killing his bed and dying his bed. Here he has like two components. One is I'll save you so you'll save me. And this way the world will be populated. It, it's like a, it's a funny way of explaining Osama and al and, and And especially when we deal with suicide, it's like I have to save you from killing yourself because the world needs to be populated. Not because you're doing an Avera in a way, but, but you know, we need you. And like, you can't take you from the world because the world needs people. So that's a very interesting way. And the question is, well, what, does that change anything? Does it help them in a way? Does it help the concept that if a person says, I, I don't really want to be part of this world, he's a way of removing himself from the world. Is that in a way say, you know what? Okay, then the mitzvah doesn't apply. Now, just as an aside, the, the Sefer Chinuch, like the Rambam, uh, the Rambam and Mordevuchim, obviously before the Chinuch, 
spends a lot of time trying to figure out the reasons for mitzvahs. Very, very often we have to point out that the reasons for mitzvahs don't inform the halachas, the actual uh, technical laws of the mitzvah. Um, so just because you, you know, in other words, and the famous example is being Shabbos. You know, if, if Shabbos is meant to rest, so I rest better by doing X, Y, Z. So if the Torah says, but if the rabbi said, this is how you keep Shabbos, you can't start saying that I'm going to apply to the Shorish of the mitzvah, the concept of the mitzvah. So just because the concept of the mitzvah might not fit with the, um, with, how our, with the technical aspects, obviously the halacha trumps the, the ideas. And that could be, by the way, that's a whole sugi in of itself, uh, philosophical perspective. And, you know, you know that's a, you, like, you take a class in philosophy or Jewish philosophy some other time, wh- how we approach ta'ameha mitzvahs, the ideas, why some Rishonim held you wouldn't talk about it, why you don't find that much in the Gemara. And again, we're not going to go into that. But here it's just instructive that the Chinuch, where the Mechaz Chinuch is writing his idea, has a very interesting concept of, of Los Amod. And it's taken even further by the Ramban. Um, the Ramban says, there's a passage in the Torah, says, Asisa hayasher v'atov Hashem. Do what is right and good in the eyes of God. The Ramban understood now, it, you, know, you can't get more vague than that passage. Do what's right and good. And that's the most vague passage you could have. And the Ramban says, you know why it's vague? It's vague on purpose. You know why? It is impossible to mention in the Torah all aspects of man's conduct with his neighbors and friends, all the various transactions, right? You know, go go look at uh, any, you know, take, uh, as I said, as you mentioned, uh, I'm the rabbi at uh, Toro Law School, right? You take a class in torts, take a class in damages, above, open above a comma. Really, every aspect above a comma should be in the Gemara, in the Torah, pardon me. But you can't. So the Torah gave, so the Ramban says a very obvious point. The Torah says, do what is right and good. And you humans have to understand that make laws and make and do things that are you know, based on the general principles to figure out how to live and how to do the right thing in the eyes of God. So all of our laws of, of not damaging each other and how, how we use shared space and all those things are part of the, are included in this Vasisa Yashvato. Now, I don't know the Ramban mentioned something interesting. For example, he mentioned many. Um, don't be a talebearer. Roshan Hara, Rechilos. Don't take vengeance, bear a grudge, nekama, right? Now, don't stand idly by the blood of thy neighbor. Ooh, whoa, ah. So here, <laughs> look at the curveball in the Ramban. What's the curveball in the Ramban? The curveball is that he includes don't stand idly by the blood of the neighbor. It's the same as I shouldn't say rechilus against you. So I shouldn't say that you are the worst doctor ever. And I also shouldn't say I should, shouldn't take your life. I shouldn't say I shouldn't stand by when your life gets taken. You know, we say in Yeshiva, what shaykhs, what connection do these things have? So this seemingly is connected to that previous source of the chinuch, that there is some societal component of Osam al damreyacha. Not a death question, not a, oh my gosh, make sure death doesn't happen, or your, your life is in the hands of God and you have no right to take it, and life is precious, which is all true. I'm not, I'm not denigrating that. But both from the chinuch, who takes Los Amal Damrecha as a commandment to make sure that society functions, which is seemingly what it says, and both from the Ramban, which is, he clearly, it puts it in, in this concept of make sure society functions, so don't, uh, don't, ta- don't tell tales, uh, don't take vengeance, and don't stand idle by when someone's being, uh, being killed. It's very societal, and not personal, not sanctity of life, and not gift of life, and not life is precious, which, again, we're not integrating those concepts, but it's clear both from these from these two sources in the Ramban and the Chinuch, that their Losam no Damrecha is not as clear as we might have thought it is or want it to be. Yeah. If you want to. It's just an interesting, um, it's hard to really tie, like you, like the, the what you mentioned in the Chinuch before, it's interesting, you can, you can wrap your head around the idea of like societal network and we have to take care of each other that's really how we thrive just from a very logical standpoint even from not from a Torah perspective just like the idea of that we have to protect society as a whole I think that's um you know religious or not religious I think that's man's mission in general that like I think most of us can agree that that we take care of each other and that's the best way to thrive but within the chinach he adds that component of 
um, inhabiting the world and how, you know, and we know that that means combining it with God and his mission to, to, you know, continue creation throughout the world. And it just, it's a very hard um, bridge between the two. Like, I, I think if you were to just see the Rambam, it'd be very clear that it's a societal thing. And he doesn't seem to mention that extra component of, of continuing um, God's inhabitants of the world. So just, I like what you mentioned earlier that highlighted what, what seems like almost two very disjointed concepts in that very, in very brief statement. He, he goes only four, <laughs> four lines there. Right, so um, again, there's a lot to think about here. In other words, I think the point of the shear, I mean, I don't know if we're done, but we're gonna sum up a little bit now. But the point of the shear is, um, I think we all intuitively um, understand the, the, the vast importance of saving lives. I believe when you're talking to the Jewish Physicians Network and you have people who are <laughs> undertaking, that for the, so. undertaking that for the rest of their lives, that other people's lives are important. You know, helping them from pain, um, saving them from pain, sorry, sorry, um, making sure that they have full lives is really what you're undertaking. And it's sort of intuitive, like, of course I'm doing it because that's the most important thing. And it is, I'm, I'm, you know, but if you delve into the sources, okay, tell me exactly where does it say I have to do it? What are the parameters and why? You, all of a sudden you, you open up, that's you know, why we learn Torah. And that's why we, we, uh, we look into the words of Chazal. It's like, it's not as intuitively uh, clear as we might have thought they were. Right. And I think that, and I think that's, um, I think that's uh, eye-opening, and that these sources. You know, so whether or not we're going to come out, you know, how, and again, we are here not here to. This is very academic. We're not giving practical advice to, to anybody. And we're not saying who to follow, and of course, that's why we have our gedolim of our shurwais to to direct us. But it, it's a great tool for all of us who, all of you, and all of us who think about and who are involved in helping other people to think about. What does the Torah define helping other people as? And it could it could be you know an unbelievable thing, and an unbelievable impetus to like you know to give more meaning to our, our actions, to, you know, in, in you know, through this study. I think again without coming to conclusions of what to do in very very delicate situations. And again, these are very very delicate situations. But for each one of us, we're not even holding at that stage yet. We might be in first year, you know, first year medicine, fourth year medicine, or wherever we may be, or anywhere afterwards. Still has an approach. Why am I doing this? What am I doing? You know, what aspect of of, of my of God's commandments am I trying to undertake? I think this is unbelievably instructive. Absolutely, absolutely. This is something that I've thought about, and and we talk about it in medical school. We talk about it from a secular perspective, and it's sometimes difficult to like bridge where your like you know religious perspective comes in and, and the secular perspective and i think this is a you know a great introduction to that and, and for anyone watching that is not so much into the academia of it we will be discussing the more practical applications but it is important to to lay the the groundwork um for which that discussion is based upon um and i think we just have one more source um at the end of the sheet if that's okay um and that's a very, in, in, and it goes back to the same, you know, dealing with the same topic. Um, but it, it's here, it's a little bit, um, we're talking about charity. So um, a lot of rules of charity, and again, it's a whole topic, but we, we're, we're going to pull out what, you know, what's relevant to us. So if a person has money, yeshlo, the ain't no till his parents, but uh, he has, he, he doesn't want to use his own money to support himself. So he shows up at the, at the charity office and says, I need a handout. Like, dude, you got money in your bank account. It's a bad one, is it? So you give him as a gift, and then you you collect. Um, so he says, what do you mean, collect? Like Mara says, <laughs> can't collect. He's not willing. So the answer is, wait till he dies, then you collect from his estate. So that means you'll give him, but then you get a. It's really a loan. It's not a gift because he doesn't deserve a gift, right? It's a rich person. Rabbi Shimon says, Yesh lo ve'enu rote lehis parnes. If you have a person who has money and he w refuses to support himself, you know what? You say, have a nice life. What if he dies in hunger? Have a the Ran says, I don't have it here, but the Ran says, too bad. It, it's his choice. So now, here you have, and now the, 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 I didn't have a chance to bring the Arch of Shulchan, but um, I'm just, I'm just can, I, can I switch screen for a second and open it somewhere else? Yeah. Um, okay, so let's just 
So, uh, okay. Just to clarify, um, it's a case where uh, it's, a, it's a wealthy person who has the means to support themselves, um, and they not, but they're, they're they're not to the extent like they're actually starving and close to death. That's what we're yeah. discussing. But we also read it. So I will read it in the Shulchan. So that a poor person doesn't want to accept charity, right? We have no, we we have to do everything we can to give him charity. The enemy says, "I don't want." You have to do. You have to trick him and say it's not charity. However, it is. Um, meaning a miser, he can't spend his own money. He just he can't bring himself to spend his own money. And he starved himself. He's got full bank accounts, but you know, for whatever reason, So that's the actual Gemara. That means, listen, if he doesn't want to eat, he wants to starve himself, meaning even causing himself to die. What are you gonna do? Says the Orach Hashochan, venerally. If he's sick because of hunger, you feed him, then you take the money back. So there's a, it's a fascinating thought, a thought question here. The fascinating thought question is, here you have, you are, you run the charity fund. You have money. And it really is designated for poor people. This man isn't poor. But he can't bring himself to spend his own money. So the halacha is technically, listen, you don't deserve charity, and we don't have to use our charity money to save your life. And technically, even if it will cause his death, we could say, not our problem. Not our problem. It says the Orach HaShulcha, that's the Gemara. So the Orach says, nearly, the Orach says, I can't, I just, to me it seems that if a guy's, you know, buy, just, just give it to him. He'll figure out how to get the money back some other time. You know, just give him the money, and then worse is worse, you'll, you'll you know, but, uh, go to his bank account and just take it, whatever it is. But you can't let the guy starve. Right? You can't be. But, you know, there, again, but strict Gemara and Rishonim, before Dorach HaShochat said his venera li, it would be, listen, this money is not for you. It's for poor people. You have money. You want to go ahead and not use your own money and cause yourself to be in danger? It's not our problem. So you would ask me, hello, lo samen o dam uh, the answer is yeah, but there's nothing to do. He, we're not giving him charity because it's not for him. We, we, we'll help. We'll gladly give him a loan. We'll gladly. He, if he refuses in such a way, we are our hands are tied. Now, again, this this is again it's a random halacha in the laws of charity, but it brings up again the same question of as as heart wrenching is it is. And as difficult as it is when a person is at the point where he's doing something so harmful and so dangerous to himself, like starving himself, because he can't just go ahead and, you know, uh, spend the money. Again, we're not talking about mental health. We'll leave that for another time. You know, what is our attitude to such a person? And it seems like from the Gemara that it's not problematic to say it's not our problem. So this really... You know, even though in the beginning, and we, you know, it's hard for us to understand the minchas chinuch, which seems to imply that it is your problem, right? And we, 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 we instinctively, intuitively want to say, whenever someone's life is in danger, it's our problem. Um, here you have another example that sometimes when a person puts his life in danger, it's nobody else's problem. And again, there is, and just want to emphasize, this is a situation where there is money to help him, but it's not meant for him. So. You know, it, that's, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. And um, that no one brings it up. It doesn't mention that it's, that it's relevant. Here. Um, so that's, I think, the last source of the booklet, um, you know, before they, the booklet wraps up. And I think, you know, if we were to, I guess, summarize, um, um, you know, in some way or shape or form, we would definitely say that the overwhelming majority of, of, of Rishonim and later, Achronim disagree with the Minchas Chinuch, um, and in situations of suicide, do you know because we view suicide as something academically as you have no right to do, therefore we would intervene. And in my crazy scenario, that if I, you know, if I 
if I'm trying to kill myself, you wouldn't kill me to stop me from killing you, right? Or uh, hire someone. But all that being true, um, the from the not from before we get to the not today, the practical and the clinical settings, um, the the it, it's a really an eye opener using the minchas chinuch and v'hashivos l'osam adam recha to get to the bottom line of what we are doing when we're thinking about other people's lives and my ability to intervene um, and what my obligations are and why they are and then how, what extent they are. It's all this one big question. I think that it's very fascinating. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's, um, it's interesting if you, if you go through the sources, you know, like we just did, and you go through the booklets, which I really heavily recommend everyone go through the booklets. We're going to have a peer-led discussion. Um, if you can't go through booklets, by all means, you know, you watch this lecture, that, that's great. And there's a summary um, there's a summary at the end of the booklet, which is a great job. And it's interesting that most of the booklet focuses on this minchatsana. And then at the end, you're kind of revealed that most people argue, um, which I think that just really highlights why it's just important to have the academic discussion. And it really sets up everything, even if in practice, we don't, you know, go with a lot of the assumptions the minchatsana is going with. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much, everyone watching. Thank you so much, Rafael. This is an amazing conversation. So happy to have you on and looking forward to the next time. Me as well. Thank you for having me. And I really enjoyed it.